Welcome into the 8 o'clock hour of KPRC 2 Plus Now. This week is Black Maternal Health Week, a campaign shedding light on the climbing maternal mortality rate, specifically among black women and mothers. Black women are three times more likely to die from pregnancy-related issues than white women. It's a staggering number, according to the CDC, and even more alarming to know nearly 80% of these deaths are preventable. Dr. Erica Giwa with Legacy Community Health is here to share her experience and how we can raise awareness about maternal mortality rate among black women and mothers. Good morning, thank you so much for your time this morning. Good morning, thanks for having me. Talk to us about why black women are experiencing so much disparities when it comes to health, especially those who are pregnant or trying to get pregnant. Well, there, there are so many reasons, and, and like you mentioned, um, black women are two to three, more, two to three times more likely to die um, from maternal mortality when compared to their white and Hispanic counterparts, and 80% of these deaths are preventable. And so one of the things that we, we know is an issue is access to care. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that we do at Legacy is promote access. We see patients who are uninsured, um, we have clinics spread out throughout the Houston area. Um, maternal mortality work groups have now started to identify that Im implicit bias and discrimination mm. also play a huge role, which is why we're seeing a lot of maternal deaths in the black mm. community. Separate from this conversation, last year I had the opportunity to interview uh, local doulas, mm -hmm. doulas working within the black community. Mm -hmm. And you know, you talk about access, that is one, one issue. But another issue that I heard from when it came to these women during pregnancy was not feeling as if they were being listened to mm -hmm. or heard in medical settings. And mm -hmm. so therefore they reached out to an advocate who could talk and listen on their behalf in addition to their families. Absolutely. Behalf as well. That is so important. And I think, um, you know, I'm a mom. Mm -hmm. um, I've had experiences where I felt like I wasn't listened to. I'm a clinician. So that is a huge, a huge part of providing care, making sure that I am paying attention to what my patient is saying. Um, and I think that doulas are amazing. They're definitely an extension of the family. If you don't have family members there, or even if you do have family members there, that's really important. Why is it these women, these women of color within this community, say they do not feel heard or seen? Um, you know, I think it's implicit bias, like I, I mentioned earlier. You know, if I'm seeing a patient and I, you know, I have these ideas about what a black woman feels, what a black woman thinks, yeah. um, then. I'm paying more attention to what I already believe than what she's telling me. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a huge part, and I think another part is relationship. I, I always tell moms that it's really important to choose a provider that you feel comfortable mm. with, one who is going to listen to you even if your ideas are different than theirs. Yeah. That's key. Mm -hmm. That's really key. What are some common uh, symptoms that may indicate a serious problem during pregnancy? So. Um, there are many. Uh, yeah. one, of the, one of the leading causes of maternal mortality or maternal death is cardiac disease. Mm. Um, also, one of the things that we pay attention to is high blood pressure. And so if you are experiencing high blood pressure, if you're experiencing headaches, shortness of breath, um, there's just a myriad of symptoms that you can feel. Um, you should definitely be in touch with your doctor. And, you know, your doctor is going to know your mm -hmm. case. Mm -hmm. So each woman is going to be hope different. They, do, right? they should. Yeah, yeah. Yes, they should. Yeah. So each woman is going to be different. So that it is so important to make sure that women are going to prenatal care mm -hmm. and discussing their particular case with their doctor so they can say, okay, Miss So and so, you need to watch out for this, whereas another patient may need to yeah. watch out for other things. Uh, one aspect that I learned on this story last year was that maternal health doesn't stop after birth. It really covers those following weeks mm -hmm. after pregnancy uh, or after giving birth. What are ways we can come together to support mothers during this stage within their life? So I'm so glad that you said that um, because that's one of the messages that we've been trying to drive home for a long time. Um, pregnancy does not end when you have the baby. You don't mm -hmm. wash your hands. It's not done at that point. There's no flipping a switch. There's no flipping right. a switch. Actually, most of the maternal deaths are occurring in the postpartum period. So one of the biggest things, the one of the things I'm so excited about is that in Texas, um, we have recently extended 
postpartum Medicaid coverage mm. to a year. So one of the things as providers, as family members, as community members that we can do is to make sure that everybody knows that. So if you have a mom who has delivered, particularly moms who are on Medicaid, make sure that they know they should be getting their postpartum care and it's for the coverage is for one year. Yeah, that's really good to know. Dr. Giwa, you, you touched upon this at the top of this conversation about being a mom yourself. Mm -hmm. I understand with that you had a scary experience, experience during your pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Are you comfortable sharing what I, happened? I, I am. Um, I uh, had my first pregnancy at 35. so. I was an older mom. Um, many ladies are choosing to go to school and pursue their career before a family. Um, so I definitely fell into that category. I've been practicing medicine for a while, so I knew all my risk factors. I'm African American, I was advanced maternal age, first pregnancy, and my blood pressures were borderline going into um, pregnancy. And you know, my prenatal care was not unusual. Um, it wasn't anything that I didn't expect. I started to develop um, elevated blood pressure towards the end of my second trimester. Um, my physician treated me as appropriate. Um, one day I was at work and I just wasn't feeling well. And so I had my nurse check my blood pressure. That's one of the positives mm -hmm. about being an OB. You can assess yeah, yourself right. at work. <laughs> so I had her check my blood pressure. It was severe range. Um, we evaluated my urine. There was protein in my urine, which is one of the signs of preeclampsia. So I contacted my physician, I was admitted. Um, my blood pressure just wouldn't come down. It stayed elevated despite being on medication and I had a persistent headache. Um, the headache is the other symptom that we, um, mm. that we look for in preeclampsia. So I delivered um, via stat C-section, emergency C-section at 31 weeks. Um, and so as an OB, everything that I said so far is what I expected. Yeah. Um, what I didn't expect was the care that I received after delivery. And so, you know, I delivered with my blood pressure was 200s wow. over 1 teens. And just for reference, normal is 120 over yeah. 80. Um, and it just stayed high. I was on multiple antihypertensives. And I, um, each night my blood pressure would go high. No one evaluated me. No one came to see if I had symptoms. No physician. Um, it was a nurse and, and I knew the group was in house, so that was odd to me. Um, at one point I said to the nurse, I said, you know, when are you going to give me, follow the protocol for severe hypertension? And so she says, you know, she gives an answer, you know, the doctors will, they know when to give it. And I told her, I said, I know when the medications are needed because I'm an obstetrician. Mm. And she got mm. the charge nurse, the charge nurse came in and I was really emotional at this point. I was well, scared. Course, yeah. And I told her, I said, I don't want to have a stroke. And she looked at me as and if you were not out. supposed to know this. Right. They well, just walked out. They didn't. And they gave me the medication that I should have been receiving IV through my veins. They gave it to me oral, which is not the same. And so the next night I, I said, you know, I want my doctor to come to my bedside. I need to speak to her. And I said, I can't have my blood pressure this high. You've got to get the blood pressure down. And so at that point, I was admitted to the ICU and given the appropriate medications. But that shouldn't have happened. It's Do you feel this treatment happened because of your race, because of who you are? <sighs> you know, I can't Do you feel say. A, a, a woman, a white woman would have received the same treatment? That is a tough question. Yeah. And looking at what we have seen, I know that race plays yeah. plays a part. Before I let you go, uh, what would be your message to to black women who either are pregnant or looking to have children, knowing this reality? If they're fearful of this reality, mm -hmm. uh, black women are more are three times more likely to die than white women during pregnancy, post pregnancy. What's your message to them? So number one, know your body. Pregnancy really doesn't start when you get a positive pregnancy test. Know your comorbidities. Choose a provider that you're comfortable with and have people around you to advocate for you. Yeah, and sing as loud as you can for as long as you can. Absolutely. We so much appreciate you, Dr. Giwa. Thank you so much for coming in no this problem. morning. No problem. Thank you very much.